seen on credibility at work, why it matters, and how it grows. I personally am really excited to hear more about this. Um, just to give a little bit of information about Richard, he's a senior pastor at Bethany Community Church, and he's taught, um, teaches conferences through the Central or Torch Bears Bible School throughout North America, Europe, and Asia. He also um, has written a book, which I'm sorry I don't have, but we um, have copies of it at our information table um, in the Center for Current Calling, called The Color of Hope, Becoming People of Mercy, Justice, and Love. And he was selected by, and this book was selected by Christianity Today as one of the best books of 2011, which is great. So uh, before I um, hand it over to Richard, I just wanted to remind you that um, to, um, most of you have signed in. Be sure and get your ticket stamped. If you attend three of these workshops, you will get this portfolio. That's a $30 value. You can pick it up on Friday at the Center for Career Home. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for taking a little bit of time at the end of the day. I, you're probably hungry and tired. And so what I'll try to do in our time together is tell you some stories from my own work experience that I hope will be helpful in applying principles uh, that will help you uh, gain wisdom in the area of credibility at work. So we're talking about, obviously we're talking about credibility at work. I'll begin by telling you a little bit of a story from my wife's uh, work history. I, my wife and I got married and I worked and she actually dropped out of Seattle Pacific to marry me, right? So uh, she had one quarter to go, but she went and married me, and I, I had a job in California. So for good or bad, she dropped out. And then she, she did a very uh, traditional, at the time, kind of stay-at-home thing, didn't really work outside the home. And, and we didn't have kids, but I'd come home and her cookies and you know, gourmet roasts and stuff, it was great. And then, I was ready to go to seminary, and she needed uh, employment. And we're moving to Los Angeles, and my, and my wife, Donna, was a little worried that she would not be able to be employable, right? Because she'd never really been in the marketplace. I have a brother-in-law who lives in Southern California. At the time, he was involved in computers and tech stuff. And so he, he asks, my wife, his sister, he says, can you type? She says, yeah. Uh, can you show up on time? Yeah. He says, not only will you find a job, but within two years you'll be in senior management. Just because you can type and you show up on time. And what he was trying to say by that is we live in a very fluid workforce and people are coming and going and often the reasons that people are coming and going are because of uh, credibility. People are promoted because of credibility, and people are shown the door because of a lack of credibility. And, and so Donna shows up, she applies for a job as a volunteer coordinator at a hospital, gets hired as the volunteer coordinator, and then moves from that into payroll, into, into uh, bookkeeping, into HR, was, a, was an assistant HR manager, and was offered the HR department but chose not to take it because she didn't want to work that many hours, but she kept climbing along without any experience, without any degree, simply because she had credibility. And so if I can teach you one thing today, it would be this. Credibility is actually the most important asset that you have. You have all kinds of skills, but the most important asset you have is credibility. So we're gonna go through this, answer three questions. Who gets hired? Why does credibility matter so much? And how does credibility grow? We're gonna answer those questions. There's an outline and the, just to help you pay attention or in case you fall asleep and you wake up and you want to pay attention again, there's blanks that you can fill along the way so you'll know where you are. And so at the beginning here, under the question of who gets hired, I'm just going to share this. Uh, uh, and this is only my own experience, but when, when we hire in our church, we be a church of about 3,500 people and so we hire pretty regularly uh, for all kinds of things both on the operational side in terms of uh, computer programmers, web designers, videographers, communications people, uh, admin support, uh, reception, uh, uh, facilities, uh, mechanics, construction stuff, and on the ministry side, all kinds of ministry positions as well. Uh, and whenever we hire, uh, we are all of us who are hiring looking through the lens of what I call three C's. 
And so I'm going to go through each of these C's because I think I am not alone in this. Many people, when they're hiring you, are assessing these three C's. And the three C's are competence, character, and chemistry. And so uh, we're looking at each of these. Competence, is this a person who has the skills that we're looking for? And a person who pays attention. Character, can this person be trusted? Do they have good judgment? And chemistry, if I'm going to be your supervisor, I'm asking this question. Will I enjoy spending time with you? And those are three vital questions that people are asking when they're interviewing you, right? So let's go back. We'll, we'll visit each of these. Number one, competence. Is this a person who has the skills and pays attention? And so for every job in our organization, uh, before we ever hire, we say, what's the skill set that we need? And then we design interview questions that will help us assess whether you have that skill set. And usually, the interview questions that we design begin with this question, tell us about a time when, and then, and then we fill in blank. And so, in other words, I don't want your learning theory from college. I want to know your what? Experience, right? So I say, if I'm, if I'm uh, uh, writing, if I'm looking, uh, for example, for a pastor who will be managing other people, I'll say, tell us about a time when you were working with volunteers and you had to fire a volunteer. Tell us about a time when you took a project from vision to reality. Tell us about a time uh, when you preached a sermon. How did you study? How did you prepare? Whatever it is. But we ask, we, we want to know what they've actually done, right? And because we need that skill set. That's the competence piece of things, right? Uh, and so I'm not only looking for those skills. But if I really like you, if the other C's are bigger, then I'm going to be willing to sacrifice a little bit here. Uh, but what I look for then, and this speaks loudly to you guys, is I really like you, John, right? And so I want John to come, and I, I, I want him to do computer programming at Bellingham Community Church, but he has never done uh, the kind of things that we need. He's not a webmaster, and we need somebody to do that. And he wants to work for us. But he also only learned about it, read it in books, and doesn't have, doesn't have a big portfolio. But I like it, right? Now I'm willing, I'm willing to cheat a little bit on the competence if he has what I call transferable skills. So I'm not only looking for skills, I'm looking for transferable skills. And particularly you, who are just coming out of college, are going to need to be able to articulate in an interview setting what your transferable skills are. And so if somebody is asking you about uh, a time when you wrote a tech manual, you, you might say, well, let me tell you about a time when I had to write something for a project, and then, and then you talk about your writing skills, or your learning skills, or your communicating skills, or your team building skills, because you did a social venture project or something in the business school. But you, you want to refer back to your experiences that demonstrate skills that are transferable uh, because you won't have necessarily work experience unless you had an awesome internship. And then that's great. But, but we're looking. We're always looking for skills. And then, still under this competence rubric, right? Not just skills, but this is the other thing I want to know about you. Do you pay attention and care about details? I always want to know that. Because work is a lot about details. So, so I'm very interested in your resume and your application, right? And, and, and what I'm interested in there is the length of your resume, not too long. And I'm sure the Career Center has lots of help to provide here. But I, I want it not too long. I want it to be very clear. And watch this, not a single typo. Read it 30 times. Have your mother read it. Have your roommate read it. Because we get a hundred resumes, right? And, and so as we're looking, I go, if you don't care enough to proofread your resume, then I don't think you're going to care about your job. That's not fair. It may not be true, but I've got a hundred resumes. And I want to get it down to 20, and then 10, and then 5, and then 1. And so I want to know that I'm hiring people who pay attention to details. Grammar, sentence structure. So really, take care of that. Because 
That is in itself a competent skill, right? Your resume, your cover letter, all that stuff. Hugely, hugely important. The good news is, at least in my world, and I don't know if this transfers to the business world, but in my world, most people write terrible resumes and cover letters. Absolutely horrible. And so, uh, when we get good letters and resumes, uh, they automatically rise to the top, right? And so, so when I'm looking for, for competence, I'm looking for skills and skill sets, some inherent in experience, and some inherent in, in transferable skills, and I'm looking for people who pay attention. That's competence. Second, character. And, and, the, and the, the question I'm asking with character is this largely, here's the question, can this person be trusted? Does, does this person have good judgment? Can this person be trusted? Do they have good judgment? Uh, and, and how do I find that out? Very easy. Two, well, two, two primary ways. A, I go to your Facebook page. And I, look, I just look at your life, right? And so if I'm interested in John, and then uh, I go to his Facebook page, and he said, yeah, I had another kegger last night, just like Thursday night, just like Wednesday night, you know, and there's pictures of him dancing on the table and stuff. Then I, I'm like this. I like you, but not anymore, right? Because your character now is in, is in question. And if you don't think that employers are looking at your personal life, you're naive. I don't know, I don't understand the legality of it. I don't know, I can't speak to it. I do know it happens, I do know. Not, and not just in the not-for-profit world, right? And so I'm looking, I'm trying to determine your character, and I do that by, by looking at things in your life that reflect your personal life. Whether it's, whether it's your Pinterest or your Facebook page or your Instagram or whatever it is that I have access to, I'll go out and look, I do. And we do as a, as a community. And the other thing that I'm interested in that helps you understand your character are reasons for leaving your job. In other words, uh, uh, I want to know your work history and, and uh, how long you stayed in places and, and why you left. So two kind of real practical applications here. Just, I want you guys to be mindful that what you're putting out there on the World Wide Web is public domain and People are determining who you are based on what's there. And so be mindful of what you're posting because uh, that, as much as your resume, is reflective of your, particularly your character, when people are looking for those to hire. And second, be mindful as you embark on kind of this professional career that uh, it's not just your skill set, but it's going to be like your work history that will paint a picture of who you are, how you make decisions, how you get along with people, uh, how, how, you, how you live into your, your calling, whatever your calling happens to be. So, so be mindful that every decision you make is painting this work history. And so if I'm, again, if I have 100 resumes, and I come to John's, and, 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 and it looks awesome, and then I go to his Facebook page, and, and it also looks awesome. He turns out he's not a Kager kind of a guy, but instead, you know, it's Friday night at the rescue mission, Saturday night New Horizons, you know, in church twice on Sunday, and teach school, Sunday school with the handicapped kids or something. I'm like, oh, oh, I like this guy. And then I look at his work history, and, and he was like six months here, a year there, two years there, three years there, 15 months here, a year there, reason leaving, bad boss, reason leaving, internal conflict, reason leaving, personal problem. You know where that resume goes? It goes in the trash, again, right? So, so this has to do with credibility, right? Because my fear is, I'm gonna hire you, and nine months from now, I'm gonna lose you, after I've invested everything in you, you see? And so, so character, can this person be trusted? Do they have good judgment? Clean up your Facebook feed, and be mindful of the work story that you're creating uh, as you, as you move from job to job to job. Competence, character. Third C, chemistry. Question for chemistry, do I enjoy hanging out with you? Do I want to spend time with you? Uh, if I'm going to be your supervisor, th there's, there's two questions or assessments that I'm making. And the first is this, just in conversation, right? I ask the question, does this person energize me or drain me? I want to know that. We're presently uh, looking for another 
uh, teaching pastor at Bethany Community Church. And so this coming weekend, uh, Saturday night, uh, I'll go out to supper with a candidate. Uh, and Monday night, I'll go out to supper with a candidate. There's no agenda. I don't have any list of questions. All It's just like it's like I'm going out to dinner with any of you. I want to get to know you, get to know a little bit about your family, these kind of things. And really, what I'm really interested in is this. At the end of that evening, am I energized or exhausted? Right? Now, why would I ask that question? Here's why. i would be spending time with you, a lot of time, some weeks, more time with you than my wife, much to my dismay. Right? And so what I want to know is, is this going to be enjoyable, or are you going to suck the life out of it? Right? And, and, and so it's, it's subjective, but it's an important thing. We, like, uh, we had a candidate years ago for a job, good resume, good experience, uh, good reference checks, good phone interview. We fly this person in, and we knew in three minutes this is not going to work. It was all, all about chemistry. We knew it, right? Uh, so that's, I mean, I mean chemistry is important. Also, equally important, under, again, this category of chemistry, I want to know how you respond to conflict and difficult situations, right? There's a, and there's a spectrum of uh, ways to blow it here, and you're kind of looking for a healthy middle, at least I as a supervisor, I'm looking for a healthy middle. I, I don't want someone who's afraid of conflict. I don't want somebody who's always going to be sweeping things under the rug, pretending everything's okay, terrified of having a hard conversation. That will be exhausting. And in the end, it won't be healthy because you can never keep everything under the rug forever. Eventually, it sprouts. And if you, and if you sweep it under the rug and you try to keep it down there, it just festers and molds, and when it does sprout, it's worse, right? So I don't want people on, on the team that are not only to have hard conversations. I also don't want people for whom every conversation is a hard conversation. Do, do you understand what I mean by that? And there are such people, right? And, and that too is exhausting. And so under the chemistry um, um, category, I would say, like, I just want to know, do you enjoy being with me? Do I enjoy being with you? It's important. And how do you respond to conflict and difficult situations? And I'll just say something about this particular one, chemistry. Chemistry is weird, right? Because uh, chemistry is not just about you, honestly. It's about, it's about you and your, your employer. It's about you and your supervisor, truly. In other words, uh, you, might, you might not work well with me, but you'd work well with him. So, so when I'm interviewing you and I'm thinking about chemistry, do I enjoy being with you? I would suggest for you guys, it's valuable to have enough self-confidence to say you're also interviewing them. Do you know what I mean? Do you want to work with these people? Or, because if you're so desperate for a job that you end up working in a place with negative chemistry, you run the risk, actually, eventually, of, of having this resume filled with short tenures because every job is exhausting. And, 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 and so there's a sense to which when we're interviewing, not only am I interviewing you, you're interviewing me. For the same reasons. You want to know if I give you energy or suck the life out of you. You want to know if everything's a, an intense conversation or if nothing's an intense conversation. And I would encourage you to avoid all of those things because that will be trouble, right? Yes? What do you consider to be a long tenure? In like a well, you know, I, I think it's, it varies from industry to industry, to be blunt. and uh, it. it and it's a little bit out of, my, out of my purview, and I defer a bit to the counseling center. But I would say I know I have friends who write code, and they're and they're freelance code writers, uh, and they and they go uh, work for Microsoft for nine months, and then they're over at Amazon, and they're doing this and that. And that's a, that's a way different than, than my setting. But if you're if you're a youth pastor and you're uh, looking for work, and you're a year a year, eight months, thirteen months. Warning lights go on in a way that they wouldn't, in, in uh, particularly in the technical side of, of the tech world, right? And so, depending on your industry, uh, you want to be mindful of those things. It's a good, it's a good question. And I'll just say on this chemistry thing, uh, you can't control it, other than it's good to be self-aware enough to know if, like, to know what emotional intelligence is. 
and to come into any interview setting with a good sense of emotional intelligence. Does that, I mean, does that make sense? I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, this same person that we picked up at the airport and we knew that this hire was like dead on arrival and we had a whole weekend planned, right? So, so we're, you know, we're driving around and this person is, uh, it's my wife and I, and this person in six hours on a Saturday, tour of Seattle, uh, you know, dinner at Shill Shoal kind of thing, didn't ask a single question about us, about our family, our kids, my wife's work. And I was like, really? Like, you're, you're not interested in us at all? And, and it's not like, I don't think I'm a narcissist where I want to talk about myself all the time, but I do think that a mark of emotional intelligence is uh, do you have the capacity and the curiosity and the natural delight enough in another person to want to ask questions? Does that, does that make sense? And, and there's a lot of things like that that constitute emotional intelligence. A good read on this as you're moving towards graduation is a book with this very clever title, Emotional Intelligence. Why it can matter more than IQ. It's, it's a good read, get anywhere. I encourage you to read that. Just for this chemistry piece, right? And don't don't worry if you don't have chemistry uh, with somebody in an interview, because chemistry isn't a moral issue. Bring your best emotional intelligence to the table, and then you either have or you don't, right? In contrast to this one who didn't ask a single question, another couple came in, this guy and his wife, and they were interviewed for a pastoral position, went out to dinner with, uh, with my wife and I, and though uh, we offered this guy the job, his heart was in Colorado, and he called me in tears and said, we decided to move to Colorado, but we're still friends now. And, and we've got a bet going on the Super Bowl, you know, the Seahawks and Broncos play. Seahawks win is the worst Seahawks jersey that Sunday after the Super Bowl, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so uh, uh, but, but we're friends still, and we may hire in the future still, right? Because there's this great, great chemistry. Now, so one more statement before we go on to question number two. Competence, character, chemistry. And here's the reality. The overwhelming majority of your, well, at least formal preparation in, in university actually prepares you for the C that matters the least, which is competence. Now, when I say the least, I, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. Competence matters a great deal, right? Uh, but you can always teach skills. You can always teach skills. You can't teach emotional intelligence. You can't teach character. And so when I'm, when I'm looking, I go, man, uh, I, if, I, if you like, say, say I need a preacher, if you like studying the Bible and, and you're a decent communicator, if your chemistry's great, and your character is great. I don't think a chance on you. But 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 if if you're like if you're the best preacher on the planet, but every time I'm around you, I'm exhausted, and I don't know if I trust you. I don't want you. So here you are. You're in the university. You're learning competence. Important? Yes. Vital? Yes. The only thing? No. It's one of three C's, and I'd give it twenty percent out of hundred percent of the total. Time. With 40 or any other two. So, the truth then is this credibility comes less from competence, more from character and chemistry. Credibility comes mostly from character and chemistry, not, not as much from competence. So, that's, that's the beginning. Who gets hired? People with this right blend of competence, character, and chemistry. Now, second question then. Why does credibility matter so much? I'm going to just I'll give you this in a, in a, in a couple of uh, sentences in a sense. I'll, I'll say it matters uh, to those above you. We'll look at that uh, to begin with. And, and under that, here's why credibility matters to those who are higher you. Because your sphere of influence grows only as trust in you grows, right? So you're going to use John as an example, right? I hire John 
He's now the webmaster at Bethany Community Church. Let's just say that, okay? Uh, and so what happens? Well, uh, he, like he's on time, and uh, we enjoy hanging out together, and every once in a while, we'll go bike riding or rock climbing or something or lunch hour, and, 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 then, so, and then we build a relationship, and as we build a relationship, he, he, like I begin to believe he's actually interested in my own well-being, right? And, and then, when I'm tired, he says, man, you look tired one day, and I go, yeah, you know, well, and then I say, here's the thing, uh, you know, we're growing too fast, or whatever I say, and then he begins to be a, not only a friend of me, but I see, oh, he's got, like, he's got some instincts regarding organizational management. I didn't know that. I hired him to write code. But what am I going to do now? Well, you know what I'm going to do now? If I can afford it, I'm going to expand his sphere of influence, and I'm going to say, look, I need you to manage our whole communication teams. Because it's really, that's what's weighing me down right now. And I trust you, not because you write good code, but because of the other two C's. Do you understand? Competence and, uh, excuse me, character, character chemistry. And so as you build that, uh, your supervisor is going to expand, a good supervisor will expand your sphere of influence. May happen slowly, but, but it happens. And it happens all the time. We hired a guy, my, uh, uh, Joe Springer's on our staff, and we hired him as our small groups pastor four years ago. And now, uh, he runs the ministry staff at our Green Lake location, and Tyler runs the whole staff. Why? Uh, I trust him. And uh, we laugh together, and we go out and eat together. And I, and I know his character is entirely above approach, and he has demonstrated skills beyond small groups, and has a passion to build a team, and that's what we need, is somebody who wants to build teams. Because I'm busy you know, traveling and teaching and writing, that kind of thing, and so he grew in that role, and, and, it, and he grew into it by his, his credibility. The, there's a quote at the very top of your first page of notes. The executives who ignited transformation from good to great did not first figure out where to drive the bus and then get people to take it there. They first got the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus and then figured out where to take it. In other words, I'm looking for the right, when I have the right person on the bus, I'm in, now I'm interested in John's development. And I want to see him use his gifts and grow and expand his sphere of influence because I want him on my team because I trust him. So this is, this is actually the way it works. Almost everywhere. It's not, that, it's not different in the corporate culture. The sphere of influence grows when your supervisor trusts you. And then, uh, I, I'm going to say, here's the other thing. Your job is like, like a poker game in a sense with chips. As, and it's kind of valuable to think this way. I brought, I brought some chips as an example. And so if I can just kind of show you here, here's what happens. When you get hired, when you get hired, you get chips, right? Everybody gets chips. Now, you get more or less chips depending on a number of factors, right? Uh, OK, you got a great resume. You get some chips for that. Um, uh, your, your interview went well, you get some chips for, for, for that. Uh, um, 40 people turn down a job before you because it only pays $9 an hour uh, and, and we're desperate now, but you took it, you get a ton of chips for that, right? So you get a lot of chips in that setting. Here's another, here, now you got, the, the center person got hired, right? And uh, here's the deal. We hired you in spite of some reservations because your resume was sketchy. You had zero experience. And, and uh, we really, we, we had a fierce debate in the HR team that interviewed you. And we have this, and we do have this very objective system where at the end, John was at 3.1 and John was at 3.0. And we went with John. But half the people wanted John, the other John. And so how many chips does he have? Not many. I mean, you understand? This is the way it works, everywhere. You get a lot of chips, or you get a little chips, depending on your situation, right? So, for example, in my, in my situation, I ended up at Bethany back in 1995, with a, and they gave me a ton of chips when I started. Because, uh, they, uh, the, my predecessor, 
resigned in 1993, and they searched for two years for Augusta, right? And so a bunch of, they, a bunch of people came in, they offered the job to a couple of people, and, and those people turned it down. And then other candidates came in, and when they saw our facilities, they said, no, this place is hopeless. And then, and then, they, then they withdrew their names. And so they had a hard time finding the kind of candidate that they wanted, and then I came and spoke there, and then they asked me to apply, and then I applied, and anyway, it's a long story. But, but uh, when they hired me, there was a congregation vote, and the vote was 100%. There was not a single no vote, right? And I feel like anybody who could walk and chew gum, they would have loved, because they were desperate for a leader. But, nevertheless, they all liked me. And so I got, I had a ton of chips at the beginning, and I said to my wife, they were voting, I said, unless the vote's 100%, I think we should even come here. And do you know why I said that? Because I knew I was going to be spending chips. Now, what does that mean? You know, you gain chips when you arrive, and then you spend the rest of your career adding chips or losing chips. That's the way it works. So, when I arrived, 100% vote, cast a vision for Ministry of the University students. Uh, pre and preacher, yeah, lots of chips. And then, immediately, uh, oh, what? You're not, you're not wearing a tie, we're not playing organ every week? I said, no, no, remember we agreed. University students, we're trying to reach university students. So we have different music, I dress differently. You know what? Dubai chips, immediately. Oh, Richard, you're dedicating babies wrong. Look, the previous pastor, he did it this way, you do it this way. I said, this is the way I do it. Go buy chips. Six months in. Uh, hey, uh, pastor's been on staff 18 years and was there when I arrived. I asked him to resign. I lost almost all my chips. I know, right? And, 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 and the church, in the first year, there grew from 300 to 200. <laughs> so, I, I needed a ton of chips. Why? Because I lost a ton of chips. Do you understand? Uh, and then, kind of slowly rebuilding the chips over, over a period of time. Uh, one college student shows up, he brings some friends, and then I go to a climbing gym and meet some other college students pretty soon. We have college ministry. Oh, we have college ministry. We have chips. And then we had a second service. Oh, no more chips. And then, and then we kept growing. Oh, more chips. And then we, then we had another service. Oh, more chips. And then we built a building. Oh, you know, I appreciate you have credibility. So this is the way it works. You're gaining and losing chips. Now, if that's the case, then when you start with chips, then here's your goal. Get more chips. I mean, it's not really your goal, but it will happen if you do these little things. Responding to emails in a timely manner. Being available to your supervisor. Keeping your promises. Being on time to meetings. Dressing appropriately. And kind of the bigger observation under dressing appropriately is that you gain credibility by your adaptability, right? If, if you're uh, in a company where he's writing code wearing Patagonia and Levi's, don't go in in a suit. But if you're, if you're in sales and everybody's wearing a suit, don't go in in Patagonia and Levi's, right? Dress appropriately. You fit into the culture, adapt. And, and finally, tell the truth. Tell the truth. All of these things gain chips. And the reason you need to gain chips is because you, you also are going to lose chips. Everybody loses chips. Why? We're human. You'll forget stuff. You'll blow a presentation. You'll get stuck in traffic. Maybe you'll oversleep once. You'll forget a meeting. There'll be a big typo on a PowerPoint presentation, a sales presentation, and you'll have to own it. And you'll, and you'll lose chips. And as long as you're making enough deposits along the way, then when you lose chips, you're, you still have an opportunity to stay in the game, right? And, and, and gain more chips back. But if you keep making withdrawals, until what? There are no more chips. I have a word for you, unemployment, right? Because when you're out of chips, really, honestly, the game's over. You've lost all your credibility. No one trusts you. And we've had situations like that in our church, an employee that we hired 
Uh, he didn't start off, to be honest, with very many chips <laughs> because, he, because he lacked experience, but then consistently late to meetings. Consistently, like 15 minutes late to meetings, he was running. And then uh, not responding to emails, forgetting details in the board report, right? Uh, uh, missing a day of work and not telling anybody. And finally, all of his direct reports came to me and said, either he quits or we're all quitting. But when that happens, he's lost all his chips. So, so uh, <laughs> credibility matters because you're gaining <laughs> and losing chips, right? And another way of saying that is trust begets trust and empowerment. Trust begets trust and, in other words, if you build trust, then, then your supervisor trusts you and then will empower you. Mistrust begets micromanaging and loss of power. If I don't trust you, I will shrink your world and, 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 and begin to micromanage you and require greater accountability, and I don't want to do that. It's exhausting. And, 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 and yet I have to do it because I don't trust you. So you're either gaining or losing trust, you're either gaining or losing chips. And, and all along the way, you will need emotional intelligence to know how to build relational bridges with, with your supervisor. And I think the bridge metaphor is really important here because the, the question between John and I is this, how much weight will this relationship hold, right? And, and, and if we're building the relationship, with encouragement and affirmation and trust and follow through and responding to emails and keeping promises, then, then we're strengthening this bridge more and more and more, and then the bridge will be able to withstand both disappointments and mistakes and hard conversations. But, but if we fail to build the bridge, and then a disappointment, mistake, and hard conversation comes up, there may not be the weight on the bridge to sustain. Does that make sense? And so, so the, th the thing to see here is you're always gaining and losing credibility, gaining and losing trust, gaining and losing chips based on your investment, and this is emotional intelligence. And, and I, don't know, I don't think there's classes taught on this stuff, but it's so, so vital, because I can't tell you how many people I know as a pastor counseling them uh, in, in life crisis because of unemployment who have incredible skills in terms of the, 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 the competent skill set needed for their trade, but no emotional intelligence. And without it, you, uh, you won't go. You won't go far. So uh, credibility matters to those above you, and it matters for those that you lead, ultimately. Because leadership is a marathon, right? Uh, uh, there's, this, there's this notion here that leadership is established in this long, slow process of building trust, and people will, will follow a hollow person who has this flash and charisma, but not forever. Do you understand? Like I can impress you in 30 minutes, maybe, but to, for you to follow me, you will ultimately you'll know me in and out, week after week after week, and either I'm building trust or losing trust. I, like I worked in LA in a church with a pastor who was a great preacher uh, and had good vision casting skills, but a terrible temper, and his temper didn't end. We were at a softball game, and the softball game was the end of his ministry. We're playing, we're, it's a church picnic, right? And he, the senior pastor, big guy, and, and he, he comes bowling in to home plate, and there's like a 12-year-old playing catcher, and he busts him over so that the guy drops the ball, and this kid is crying with a bloody nose, and, and here's the senior pastor, and he stops on home plate and goes, we win! And we were, we were all like, what are, you, what are you doing? And then he got mad about it and defended himself. And then within three months, unemployed. Do you understand? It's, it's a great, it's a, to me, a great example because it's so blatant. Most, most examples aren't that blatant, but it's the same principle, right? And in contrast to that, my predecessor uh, just died and there was a funeral uh, uh, on Saturday. He was a pastor at Bethany for 38 years. 38 years. Man, in that period of time, do you know what? You you know each other inside and out. You're slowly, slowly, slowly building chips. He had so many chips that there were over 300 people at his funeral and it was during the Seahawks play. Like, who does that, right? Only somebody who's dearly loved, and that's from building 
credibility. The people who adored him most were the four pastors who worked under him. And they spent all day praising this guy. So, credibility matters because as you begin to lead others, and you will, uh, your credibility will en enable those who you are serving as a leader to trust you. And finally, credibility matters because people won't risk following a leader they don't trust. People will not risk following a leader they don't trust. Uh, when we built a new uh, building at Bethany Community Church, uh, there was an estimate it was going to cost $5 million. We had a fundraising thing. We raised four. That was good. And then uh, the, like the chairman of our construction committee said, we have a meeting. Uh, some things have come up. You didn't know there's been a change in the cost, right? So we met at Starbucks down at Green Lake. We'll never forget the night we met. He says, um, hey, I, I know we thought it was going to be five, but uh, this is like in a building boom, like 2005. And he goes, construction costs have gone through the roof. Concrete has doubled. Anyway, here's the news. The new final price, $6.9 million. We thought it was going to be five. It's $6.9 million. And I was like this, we can't do this. We can't do this. But this guy, our, our leader, like the chair of this committee, he had built uh, both EMP and the Seattle Public Library. He was a construction manager, a construction manager on both departments, right? And so he had tons of what? Credibility, right? And he says, seven, six point nine million. I go, seven, basically. He, I go, no, we can't do it. He says, we've got to do it. I said, we're not going to do it. And then, I'll never forget, he slams his fist on the table and he points at me and he says, we're doing this and we're doing this. God is in it. I know God is in it. And the only reason that we did it is because he slammed his fist on the table. <laughs> really, honestly. And I trusted him. And why did I trust him? Not just because he built EMP, though that helped a lot. I trusted this guy because his character was impeccable. I knew that he was the same in private as in public. He had nothing to hide. And I would follow him anywhere. And because I trusted him, we did it. So, people will not risk following a leader they don't trust. And so you have to build credibility so that you can lead. Final question, and this is where we get into a little bit of the Bible as we bring this down. How does credibility grow? Three ways. First, credibility grows, oh, well, there's four, but we're only at three. Credibility grows when you use your gifts and talents. Credibility, credibility grows when you can deal with conflict. And credibility grows through your authenticity. Credibility grows uh, when you use your gifts and talent. Credibility grows when you can uh, deal with conflict. Credibility grows through authenticity. And uh, for this, uh, uh, I'm going to take you to scriptures. Credibility grows when you use your gifts and talents. In other words, uh, uh, it says in Ecclesiastes, uh, I think it's chapter 9, Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your mind. So and let me paraphrase that. Like, if John loves writing code, then that's what he should do. He should find a way, if possible, to write code. And if there's no code jobs in the moment, he should still write code. Right? Somehow. Because if, if you find what you're wired to do, and then pour yourself into that, right? That will give you credibility. Because you'll, have a, you, you'll be operating this in the area of your, of your strength, right? So you need to find your strengths and make every effort to use them regularly and develop them, right? If you're sitting here and you, and you don't know what your strengths are, I would, I would just say you don't have to panic if you don't know what your strengths are. The, the Career Center has tons of tools that will help you find your strengths. And finding your strengths really mostly happens as you go out and begin to live life, right? I like, it's funny to be in here because I was a music major at Seattle Pacific. And, I, and I, I've sat here in recitals and played on this crazy little piano here 30 years ago, right? And I, at the time, if you had said to me, I'm a pastor, I would say, you're crazy. It wasn't even on my list of possibilities. And yet, God showed me over a period of time, this is what I'm to do. And I'll just say, here's your strength. Just in a nutshell, your strength is going to be something that energizes you, and it's affirmed by others. And both of those are important. Does that make sense? 
Like, if you're energized, if I'm energized by writing code, but, but, I'm, but I'm terrible at it, that's not my strength. Just because I like doing something doesn't make me good at it, right? I, I told my church, I, like all through junior high, I played basketball, and I wanted to play basketball. I, I, I used to dream about you know, being a basketball player. And I turned out for high school basketball in grade 10, and uh, I went to this giant high school that had 2,600 students, and some of the players go on to play uh, Division I basketball, and some of them play in the NBA. And, and so I go out to summer league, and I'm on the court like an hour. The coach pulls me aside, and he goes, hey, are you in the band too? And I go, yeah. He goes, well, I think that's a better place for you to invest your time, right? It's like immediately, okay, I love this sport, and all day long, I can hit uh, three-point shots from 22 feet out, but I weigh 110 pounds and I'm 5'8", right? This is hopeless. And he just, he just said, you know, I, I consider music if I were you. And I was good at music, and that, that got me through, you know, high school. Fine, but, but your strength will both energize you and be affirmed by others. And so keep looking until you find that sweet spot and then pour yourself into that. And the beauty of that is knowing your strength is both freeing and constraining. It's free because I know what I'm supposed to do. John's supposed to write code. He knows it. So he's going to write code. But if he's going to get good at that, you know, the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour principle. Like if he's going he's to really be good at writing code, he's not going to be like uh, doing Tour de France, right? Uh, he's, like you, or, or, or painting stuff that's going to end up in a loop. Like you don't, you find what you're good at, you do it. And so it's liberating to me to know that, that I'm a teacher and a leader and a writer. And, and, and then these other things, I don't worry about being good at, that I really enjoy. I enjoy skiing. I enjoy climbing. I enjoy photography. I enjoy music. But I'm perfectly happy to be mediocre at all of them. Because just, they're just hobbies that energize me. But where I'm going to spend my time is teaching leadership writing. Do you understand? And so kind of the principle there is your credibility grows when you find your gifts and talents and use them. Next principle, your credibility grows when you can deal with conflict. And the, the story here is a weird one that comes from the scriptures in Exodus chapter 4. God is calling Moses to a role of leadership that the, Moses doesn't necessarily want. And so Moses says, listen, if you want me to lead, I need credibility. Because he, he asks the question regarding credibility, what if they won't believe or listen to what I say? What if they won't believe me? When I say, hey, God wants me to free you all from Egypt and you know, take you into a new place, what if they won't believe? What if I say the Lord hasn't appeared to you? Where does my credibility come from? God says to him, hey, Moses, what's in your hand? He has a staff, a stick, right? God says, throw it to the ground. He throws it to the ground. It becomes a snake. Moses starts running away. God says to Moses, stretch out your hand, grasp the snake by its tail. So he stretches out his hand, catches it, becomes a staff, and then God says, that's how they'll believe. That's a very interesting story, uh, but what does it mean, right? First of all, who, uh, who, we're in the Northwest, we don't encounter snakes that much. Who's encountered snakes in here before? Like uh, scary snakes, not, not bush snakes or something like that. Yeah, so the scary snakes, like if you're in Southern California, there's rattlers. Those suckers are terrifying, right? I was hiking at San, Mar San Bernardino Mountains with my wife, and we come around a corner of a trail. There's a rattlesnake right in the middle of the trail, and as soon as it sees me, it coils and starts shaking its tail. And I was like, snake! And I, ran, I totally ran the other way, and my wife, I passed her, so that was her. <laughs> and, and, and then she's running the other way. Scary. Totally counterintuitive to pick it up. What is all that about? Well, uh, here's the deal. Uh, I, don't, I don't have time to prove this to you theologically, but uh, maybe you trust me, may have credibility, I don't know. Uh, but here's the deal. I believe this story is talking about our willingness to engage in conflict, right? It's, none of us like conflict, we're gonna run the other way. But our credibility grows when we deal with conflict yeah. Right? So, so, so encouragement there, stay in the conflict. Stay in. I learned this very early. I was going to seminary in Los Angeles. 
Uh, my wife and I were running a backpacking trip uh, for uh, high school students. We were concerned on the trip. There was a guy and a girl who were like very, uh, you know, into each other all the time, right? They're always hanging on each other. And we just want to make sure that, that uh, you know, nothing awkward happened on the trip. So I made a rule thinking, you know, if I raise the ante, everyone will fall in line. And so I said, look, if the, if the girls and guys are ever in each other's tents, we're going to end the trip right there and go home. And we're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. Uh, yeah, we'll, we're, we're clean, you know. Well, I wake up one morning three days into the Sierra Nevada Mountains, and here's a, here's a tent that's supposed to be occupied by four girls, and three girls are sitting outside the tent, and the girl that I was most worried about is missing, so she's in the tent. And so I wake up these three girls, I go, hey, what are you doing? And they go, hey, ha, and they're laughing like they've been caught, you know? They go, we're, oh, we're looking at the stars. And it's so foggy, you can't even see the tops of the trees. <laughs> and I said, you know, look at the stars, and I unzip the tent, and there's the guy and the girl in the tent. And I was, and I was so angry. And I don't get angry very easily. I want to kill the guy. But that's my own bias. And, and I said, I said, that's it. The trip's over. Put your bags. We're going home. Da, 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 da. So, you know, I've studied architecture. This is my first foray into ministry. First experience in ministry is this trip. And, and, and so then, I drop the guy off at his house. And, and, and I say to his dad, we came home early because of your son, blah, blah, blah. Well, we'll deal with it, he says. Then I drop the girl off. Her parents don't go to church. Got to tell you what happened. Because of this, we ended her up. And he was mad. All of you listen. That was Saturday. Monday morning, I had a call in the church office. First, from the girl. Richard, swear, 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 swear. I hate you. Da, 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 da. And I'm never coming to church again. Da, 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 da. Oh, why? Well, because my dad got so mad, he broke my nose. He oh my broke my nose in the emergency room. And he, he'll never let me go to church again. And then she just, and who cares? Anyway, I hate all you Christians. And she slams down the phone, right? So I'm like, that was not a good call, right? And then, and then the mom of the guy calls, like immediately, within 10 minutes. Hello? Hello? Swear, 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 swear. And she goes to our church. And then this is what she says, I'm going to sue you. And I'm gonna, they're going to sue the church. She says, I said, sue the church for what? Invasion of privacy. If, <laughs> if, if my son wants to sleep with every girl on that trip, that's his private. You'll hear from my attorney by the end of the day. Boom, she slams out of the phone. So then I was like this. I go, to, I go to my office. This is in the days of typewriters. Piece of paper, typewriter. Dear senior pastor, you're going to be sued this afternoon later. <laughs> And so this is my letter of resignation. And then I wrote, I just wrote, I wrote out everything that happened. I said, you know, I set this standard and I had to maintain it. I told the parents now, now this family's gonna sue the church. So, uh, I, and then I wrote the answer. I think I'm meant to be an architect. That's what I said. I was gonna, I was, I was gonna go back and finish my architecture degree. It's fine. So I go in, I hand it to the, to the senior master. And he, he reads it, he goes, and he just laughs. He's laughed. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not resigning. Tears it up, throws it. You're not. I said, what do you mean? They're gonna sue us. He said, oh, they're gonna sue us. He says, watch this. And I don't recommend this, but this is what he does. He picks up the phone. He calls the lady. He says, oh, you're gonna sue us. We're gonna sue you first. That's what we're gonna do. You know, our, my youth pastor's gonna have a nervous breakdown. And I'm gonna sue you for emotional distress. I'm saying it, my eyes are big like this. And he slams the phone down, and then, whatever you think of that, this is what stuck with me. He, this is what he said. He said, you know what? This is the day your credibility begins. That's what he said. He said, you'll never have credibility until you've worked through conflict. He says, if you walk now, this is your future. Six months conflict, six months conflict, two years conflict. You want credibility? Hang in there. And I did. And the last thing that I did before leaving LA was baptize that girl. She came to Christ. So you hang in, right? Don't be afraid of conflict. Do, deal with it with emotional intelligence, but don't be afraid of it. 
Because if you run, you'll be a journeyman, always moving from job to job every time things get hard. You can't do that. Lastly, credibility grows through your authenticity. Moses is, he, God gives him a second sign. God says to Moses, hey, uh, take your hand, put it in my New American Standard Bible, it says put it in your bosom. What is it? Whatever, right? Put it, so put it in your shirt. Moses puts his hand in, he, and when he pulls it out, it's, it's leprosy, right? You know what I mean? Like this sick disease. Then God says, put it back in. He puts it back in, and it's cleansed. And then this is what God says. That's your credibility. What does that even mean? Well, in the same way that the servant represents conflict, uh, leprosy represents sin in the Old Testament. And so here's what God is saying regarding Moses. He says, look, Moses, you want to know what will give you, what will give you credibility in ministry? The, not the fact that people see that you have no flaws. Because here's the problem, you do. <laughs> it's not that people see flaws. People will see your transformation from flawed to healed. Do you understand? And that's your credibility. Your credibility, in, your credibility is in your transformation. And so if you spend your entire career pretending to be bigger than you are, better than you are, holier than you are, you have nowhere to go. So, so how liberating is this? Be who you are. Right? Well, there we go, a guy uh, visited Bethany Community Church. He'd just come to Christ. And he was visiting our church and you know, in another church in town. And then he, he said, look, uh, I, I need to know like what you believe about it. We were in a talk about some nuanced issues about homosexuality. He went, I said, what? What do you believe? And, and this is what I said. I said, I don't know. And then he said, and I, and I knew, I knew as soon as I said it, that's it. Who wants to follow somebody who says, I don't know? Right? He said to me, that's why I'm going to become a member of that. Because you don't know. You're willing, you're willing to live for now in the ambiguity of it until you understand it. And I just go, what a great default position, right? To say, if I don't know, to say what? I don't know. To say, if, I, if I've never done this before, to say what? I've never done this before. I'm willing, but I've never done it before. To say what I am. And, and for me, with my staff, to own my failures, what people see, I hope, is transformation. Because credibility comes not from presenting yourself to be bigger than you are. Credibility comes from people seeing you move from here to here to here to here. And people saw it in Moses. They saw anger in Moses. They saw melancholy in Moses. They saw frustration in Moses. They were frustrated with Moses at times. And yet when Moses died, it says the whole nation was Israel mourned for weeks because he was for them a great leader. In spite of his flaws. And you can be a great leader or a great employee just by being who you are if you grow in credibility. Okay? That's it. It's 531. It's been a blast. Thank you for the privilege of sharing. I don't know where you go or what you do. Do you have any questions? I think I put my email on here.